Chapter Number One of Our Little Canadian Cousin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rene Lacroix. Our Little Canadian Cousin by Elizabeth Roberts MacDonald. Chapter Number One. It was the very first day of the loveliest month in the year. I suppose every month has its defenders, or at least its apologist. But June, June in Canada, has surely no need of either. And this particular morning was of the best and brightest. The garden at the back of Mr. Merrithew's house was sweet with the scent of newly blossomed lilacs and the freshness of young grass. The light green of the elms was as yet undimmed by the dust of summer, and the air was like the elixir of life. Two children sat on the grass under the lilacs, making dandelion chains, and talking happily. Jack, a little fair-haired boy of six, was noted for his queer speeches and quaint ideas. His sister Marjorie was just twice his age, but they were closest chums, and delighted in building all sorts of air castles together. This afternoon, when she had finished a chain of marvelous length, she leant back against the lilac trees and said, with a sigh of happiness, Now, Jack, let's make plans. All right, Jack answered solemnly. Let's plan about going to Quebec next winter. Oh, Jackie, don't let's plan about winter on the first day of June. There's all the lovely, lovely summer to talk about, and I know two fine things that are going to happen. All right, said Jackie again. It was his favorite expression. I know one of them. Daddy told me this morning. It's about Cousin Dora coming to stay with us. Yes, isn't it good? She's coming for a whole year, while Uncle and Aunt go out to British Columbia to make him well, you know. I wish she was a little boy, said Jackie thoughtfully. But if she's like you, she'll be all right, Margie. What's the other nice thing you know? Oh, you must try to guess, dear. Come up in the summer house. It's so cozy there, and I'll give you three guesses. It's something that will happen in July or August, and we are all in it. Father and mother and you and cousin Dora and a few other people. They strolled up to the vine-covered summer house and settled down on its broad seat while Jack cudgeled his brains for an idea as to a possible good time. "'Is it a picnic?' he asked at last. Marjorie laughed. "'Oh, ever so much better than that,' she cried. "'Try again. "'Is it... is it a visit to the seaside?' "'No, even better than that. "'Is it a pony to take us all driving?' "'No, no, that's your last guess. Shall I tell you?' Ah, oh, yes, please do. Well, mother says, if we do well at school till the holidays, and everything turns out right, she and father will take us camping. Camping? Camping out? Really intense? Oh, good, good. And Jackie, the solemn, was moved to the extent of executing a little dance of glee on the garden path. Camping out? is a favorite way of spending the summer holiday time among Canadians. Many, being luxurious in their tastes, build tiny houses and call them camps, but the true and only genuine camping is done under canvas, and its devotees care not for other kinds. As our little New Brunswickers were talking of all its possible joys, a sweet voice called them from the door of the big brick house. Marjorie! Jack! Do you want to come for a walk with mother? There was no hesitation in answering this invitation. The children rushed pell-mell down the garden path, endangering the swaying buds of the long-stemmed lilies on either side. Mrs. Merrithew stood waiting for them, a tall, plump lady in gray, with quantities of beautiful brown hair. She carried a small basket and trowel, at sight of which the children clapped their hands. Are we going to the woods, mother? Marjorie cried, and may I take my cart and my spade? 
asked Jackie. Yes, dearies, Mrs. Merrithew answered. We have three hours before tea time, and Saturday wouldn't be much of a holiday without the woods. Put on your big hats, and Jack can bring his cart and spade, and Marjorie can carry the cookies. Oh, please, let me haul the cookies in my cart, said Jack. Gentlemen shouldn't let ladies carry things, father says. But Margie, you may carry the spade if you want something in your hands very much. All right, boy, laughed Marjorie. I certainly do like something in my hands, and a spade will look much more ladylike than a cookie bag. The big brick house from which Mrs. Merrithew and the children set out on their walk stood on one of the back streets of a little New Brunswick city, a very small but beautiful city, built on a wooded point that jets out into the bright waters of the St. John River. Of this river the little Canadian cousins are justly proud, for, from its source in the wilds of Quebec to its outlet on the Bay of Fundy, it is indeed a thing of beauty and a joy forever. Our little party soon left the streets, went through a wide green space covered with venerable maples, crossed a tiny stream and a railway track, and entered the woods that almost covered the low hill behind the town. Though it was really but one hill, the various roads that subdivided it gave it various names, some derived from the settlements they led to, and some from buildings on the way. It was through the woods of College Hill that Marjorie and Jack and their mother wandered. Being all good walkers, they were soon back of the fine old college, which stands looking gravely out over the tree-embowered town to the broad blue river. When the delicious green and amber shadows of the woods were reached, little Jack at once began to search for fairies. Marjorie contented herself with looking for wild flowers, and Mrs. Merrithew sought for ferns young enough to transplant to her garden. "'I am afraid I have left it rather late,' she said at last. "'They are all rather too well grown to stand moving, but I will try a few of the smallest. What luck have my chicks had? Any fairies, Jackie?' Jackie lifted a flushed face from its inspection of a tiny hole in the trunk of a fir tree. "'No fairies yet, mother, but I think one lives in here.' only she won't come out while I am watching. Mrs. Merrithew smiled sympathetically. She heartily agreed with the writer, though she could not remember who it was, who said, I always expect to find something wonderful, unheard of, in a wood. In olden days, she said, people believed that there were beautiful wood spirits called dryads, who had their homes in trees. They were larger than most fairies, and yet they were a kind of fairy, "'Please tell more about them, mother,' said Marjorie, coming up with her hands full of yellow speckled adder's tongue. "'I know very little more, I'm sorry to say,' their mother answered, laughing. "'Like Jackie with his fairies, I have always hoped to see one, but never have as yet. "'Are they good things?' Jackie asked. "'Or would they frighten little boys?' "'Oh, my dear, they were always said to be kind and beautiful.' and rather timid, more apt to be frightened themselves than to frighten anyone else. But remember, dears, mother did not say there were such things, but only that people used to think so. Please tell us a story about one, mother, Jack pleaded. But Mrs. Merrithew shook her head. We will keep the story for some other time, she said. Let us have a cookie now, and a little rest before we go home. This proposal was readily agreed to. They chose a comfortable spot where a little group of white birches gave them backs on which to lean, opened the precious bag, and were soon well occupied with its crisp and toothsome contents. Mrs. Merrithew, knowing well that little folk are generally troubled with a wonderful thirst, had also brought a cup and a bottle of lemonade. How doubly delicious things tasted in the clear, spicy air of the woods! By the time Jack had disposed of his sixth cookie, he felt ready for conversation. Mother, he said, I wish you would tell us all about Dora. All about Dora, dearie? That would take a long time, I expect. But it would not take long to tell you all that I know about her. I have only seen her twice, and on one of those occasions she was a baby a month old, and the next time only two years and as she is now, I do not know her at all. But, 
oh you know mother tell us about her father and mother and her home and everything like that it makes her more interesting urged marjorie mrs merrithew saw that she was to be beguiled into a story in any case so she smiled and resigned herself to her fate well my dears i know a great many things about dora's father for he is my only brother and we were together almost constantly until we were both grown up then your uncle archie who had studied electrical engineering went up to montreal and there secured a good position he had only been there a short time when he met a very charming young lady this sounds quite like a book story marjorie here interposed by whom he was greatly attracted she was partly french her mother having been a lady of old french family but her father was an english officer of the strongest english feelings so this charming young lady whose name was denise ellingham combined the characteristics at least all the best characteristics of both races do you know what that means jackie jack nodded thoughtfully i think so mother i think it means that she that young lady had all the nicenesses of the french and all the goodnesses of the english that is just it my dear and a very delicate distinction too cried his mother clapping her hands in approval while jackie beamed with delight well to continue miss denise ellingham when your uncle archie met her was an orphan and not well off she was teaching in an english family and not i think very happy in her work she and your uncle had only known each other about a year when they were married and lived happily ever after marjorie asked mrs merrithew considered a moment then yes i am sure i can say so she answered they have had some business troubles and a good deal of sickness but still they have been happy through it all and they have one dear little daughter whom they love devotedly and who is named dora denise after her mother and who else you mother you both children exclaimed the chief trouble this happy trio has had, Mrs. Merrithew continued, has been the delicate health of your uncle. For the last four years he has not been strong. Twice they have all three gone away for his health, and now the doctors have ordered him to try the delightful climate of British Columbia, and to spend at least a year there, if it agrees with him. He needs all his wife's attention this time. And that, my dears, is why little Dora Denise Carmen is coming to spend a year with her New Brunswick relations. And now, chicks, look at that slanting golden light through the trees. That means tea time and homeward bound. End of chapter number one. Recording by Renee Lacroix, Woodstock, Ontario, Canada.